okay, if Jesus comes into the world and he fulfills all of the Old Testament law and prophets, as Christians believe, but what he did spoke not a word to the pagans, it would seem like a foreign invasion because Jesus is the, 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 the Jewish Messiah, but he's also, we believe, the savior of the world. And so the way I like to put it is, Jesus not only fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets, he fulfilled the highest yearnings of the pagan people. If he came into the world and it meant nothing to the pagans, then it would, it's got nothing to do with us. But no, it turns out that he has fulfilled specific Old Testament prophecies, but he is also the true myth, the true Dionysus, the true uh, Hercules, but without the horror of those Greek myths. And, and, and it, the, I mean, you know, I just want to ask, because this is such a big idea. Um, that moment uh, on Addison's walk in Oxford, England, when Tolkien suggests this to Lewis, and of course, Lewis writes about this uh, in his memoir, Surprised by Good. Joy. You, you wonder, um, Tolkien, obviously, who loved myth like crazy, must have been thinking about this himself for many years because he knew the myths, the Norse myths. And there's that line in Surprise by Joy where Lewis is quoting Longfellow's poem oh, yes, yes. about the Norse god, Balder the Beautiful is dead, is dead. And it's this haunting, why, he was asking the question, why is this haunting me? Right. I'm reading about some fictional yeah. Norse god, but it haunts me like it somehow speaks to some part of me and that's the connection is that is. he's saying, I mean, th th this is what you're saying in your book, I, I, I assume, is that he recognized that there's something deeper. Welcome to Socrates in the studio. I have the privilege right now of talking to a very dear old friend, my goodness, Dr. Louis Marcos of Houston Christian University here in New York. Thank you for being with us. It's good to be here. And Eric, I want to start by explaining why it is I'm wearing this white tux. It's because I heard that you have a lot of, you know, big people watching your show. Huge. Yeah. And now that Daniel Craig has stepped down, I'm, I'm you know, auditioning to be the next James Bond. Um, I just want you to know well, that. You know what? Yeah. The, here's a weird thing. Here's a weird thing. This is the, everything leads to everything. Um, one of the folks that I have interviewed uh, at, it was a Socrates in the City event in Oxford. Oh, okay. Uh, it was the Oxford Conversations. Uh, it's Dr. Michael Ward. Are you familiar Great with him? Guy. He's now He's father, father That's Michael right. Ward. He father, yeah. Okay. He has an actual connection to the yes, 007. The world is not enough. He was in a Bond, yeah. James Bond film. He did. So you should talk to him. He handed the glasses to James Bond. Right, right. It's a great scene. I think we're done here. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you today. You and I uh, were, were just like bursting with enthusiasm over ideas. It's why I love you and love talking to you because it's fun to talk about ideas and truth and goodness and beauty, all of which typically leads us to C.S. Lewis one way or the other. Right. So you wrote a book. Um, it, it, Lewis is not in the title, but it immediately makes me think of C.S. Lewis. And the title of the book is The Myth Made fact beautiful title i'm amazed nobody ever used it before mm -hmm. the myth made fact uh reading greek and roman mythology through christian eyes uh let's start maybe we could start with the uh, with the rather famous story of lewis who was friends c.s lewis of course was friends with j.r.r tolkien uh do we, do we want to start with that story? I think it's great. It's one of my favorite stories. Now, a lot of your listeners probably know that Lewis was an atheist for many years before he became a Christian. But a lot of people think that Lewis went directly from atheism to Christianity, but he didn't. That's the story of Josh McDowell. That's the story of Lee Strobel, the story of, of your friend Chuck Colson. That's very typical. But Lewis took a two-step process. First, he became a theist. In other words, a believer in God, that there's one good God that's the origin of morality. But it took Lewis another about year and a half to move from being a theist to being a Christian. What was holding him back? A he lot was, of stuff. A lot of things. It's what's holding a lot yeah, of people a lot back. Of people, it's right. easy to say, like, oh, yeah. I believe in God. Yeah. But, I mean, actually, I remember in my own life, um, somebody saying, like, isn't it okay if I just believe in God? Like, right, when yes. I had become a Christian, 
like the Christian thing makes people uncomfortable, the Jesus thing. Yeah. They're like, I'm, I'm good with God. Can I stop there? So Lewis has this famous, when he writes, this is all in his book, Surprised by Joy, but he says, you know, the, what does he call himself? The most reluctant yeah, convert yeah. in all of England. He becomes a believer in God. Yeah. But that is a long way in his life from what we're now going to discuss. You know, Josh McDowell began his famous book, More Than a Carpenter. He says, you know, go to New York City, get in any cab. You can talk about God all day. Everything's fine. As soon as you mention Jesus, that, that, that's the end of the conversation, right? It's, it's like, get too real now. It's getting too into my life. There's sort of this accountability. There's more baggage. Yeah, there's more baggage. Yeah. It's like, wow, I, I may actually have to change the way I think or act or whatever. So Lewis was, you know, happy just being a, a, a theist. And Lewis was an English professor like myself. And like myself, he also loved mythology, Greco, Roman, Norse, Egyptian, everything. And Lewis was a big fan of a book called The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser, sort of late Victorian writer. And he, his name is not as well known today, but a lot of people know the name Joseph Campbell. He was sort of the Joseph Campbell of his day. He liked to study ancient groups, ancient tribal groups, and look for connections and one of the things he loved to look for were archetypes. Archetypes, again, Joseph Campbell influenced uh, 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 Star Wars. Um, uh, George Lucas, you know, loved reading because the idea is that there are certain images or events or characters that appear again and again throughout time, right. throughout culture, that th this, these odd things. So the best example everybody knows is the, the image of the wise old man, the archetype of the wise old man. And whether it's Gandalf, whether it's a Dumbledore, whether it's Obi Wan Kenobi, whether it's a sensei and a Jap you know, in a, in a martial arts movie, everybody recognizes that image. All right, Sir James Fraser, 150 years ago, he identified something that he saw in the ancient world, and we now call it the Corn King. Now, first of all, we need to understand, uh, Eric, that when a British person says corn, he doesn't mean corn; he means wheat. Right? Really? Yeah. When he when he wants to say corn, he says maize. I so, did not know like that. If you study the Victorian age, and they're talking about the corn laws, those are the laws that are talking about the the back and forth of wheat. That's why if you read the King James, except a corn of wheat, it says. But if you read anything except a grain of wheat, I just realized that etymologically yeah. there's a connection between the word kernel and corn. Right. Cornel, kernel and corn. I've never. A I love etymology. Yeah. But because every word is Greek. and corn, because every word is Greek. So there you go. So, okay, so you're talking about the Golden Bough classic work. Right. Uh, and, and one of the themes that he sees, this is uh, uh, Frazier, throughout numerous mythologies is this... The corn king. The corn king. And, and what this is, is a story about a god or a demigod coming to earth, often dying a violent death, and then returning. Now, it's not a literal resurrection, but basically what these stories are, are seasonal myths about the death, life, death, and rebirth. And th th this is in great. And to make it clear, if you are an Egyptian, your corn king is Osiris, the sort of dying, rising god. If you're Greek, you call him Adonis, or you call him Bacchus. If you're Norse, you call him Balder. If you are a uh, Babylonian, you call him Tammuz, who's actually mentioned in the Bible, and I think it's Ezekiel. Uh, if you are Persian, you call him Mithras. So again and again, this odd story that is across cultures of a sort of dying and rising God. So now, Fraser didn't say this specifically because he was a Victorian, but basically he believed that Jesus was just the Hebrew version of the corn king, just another myth. And Lewis said, well, what has it got to do with me, this, this rabbi that dies 2,000 years ago? What, what has it got to do with anything, right? It's just another myth, and that's where he was. And then one day, when Lewis was 32 years old, he and his good friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, author of Lord of the Rings, very strong Catholic, they were taking a walk around, okay, Maudlin College, Oxford, has this beautiful tree-lined walk called Addison's Walk. It's around an old deer park. You've been, I, listen, I've been there many I times, love, and I my love favorite C.S. Lewis poem Oh, yes, it's right there. Is called, um, the, I, actually, I don't remember the title of it, but it starts out, I heard in Addison's walk a bird sing clear. This year, the summer will come true. This year, this year. It is, it, it's so, I'm getting choked up. It's one of the most beautiful poems I've ever read. And uh, 
it really points to a lot of the stuff we'll probably end up talking about right now. But so, yeah, Lewis was late one night. He was actually first he was in his rooms, right. as they put it, in, in, in the new college, which is the, the building at at, uh, at Magdalen right. College in Oxford, talking to, uh, was it Hugo Dyson? Yeah, it was Hugo Dyson. Yeah, it was just and three Tolkien. of them. Tolkien. And, and both of them were they're, Christian. They're talking, they're about, talking about these issues. Stuff. And then they decide to take a walk. Yeah. Like, hey, it's, it's, it's like, like 1 a.m. Let's yeah. take a walk at, on the, Addison's these Walk. These big trees, and as they're walking around, and this breeze comes out of nowhere and blows the leaves and all of this. It's just a beautiful one. And as they're walking around, they're discussing this very issue. And Lewis is like, you know, I can't believe this. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's just another myth, right? And then Tolkien said the words that not only changed Lewis's life, changed the life of millions of people, right? He said Jack was his nickname for C.S. Lewis. Jack, did you ever wonder, maybe the reason that Jesus sounds like a myth is because he's the myth that came true or the myth that was made fact. Let me just give you a, a simple parallel example of this. You and I are about the same age. We go to, we go to public school and we take social studies because they haven't taught history in our country in a very long time. So we're taking social studies and we're reading the great epic of Gilgamesh that has this exciting flood story. And then if you had the typical teacher I did, she would say, now children, we now know that every ancient culture has a story of a global myth. And that just shows that the Bible is just a myth. And I remember even at the precocious age of, what is that, 11, thinking, ma'am, there's another way to interpret that data, <laughs> okay? If every single, this includes like the Aborigines and then the Native American Indians. I mean, all around, if they all have a global flood myth, that suggests to me that there was a global myth, right? Flood, right? Where else did yeah, it come of from? Of course, anybody yeah. who's watched the uh, the TV series on Netflix, Ancient Apocalypse. Oh, yeah. Uh, he talks about this. And it, it's at least fascinating yeah. when you recognize how many peoples around the world have the same story. Yeah. Um, so the so the the, the 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 flood is one right, um, and the dying God yeah. that is resurrected is, is is another one. So okay, so, it, it, we, we have to be clear that Tolkien and Lewis they were super geniuses, oh, yeah. uh, experts on the subjects of myth, legend, of all of myth. That. I mean, they just loved all yeah. that stuff, right? So it's like so in the same way that okay, the, the, there must have been a flood. Well, maybe in every other culture it only retained mythic value but only amongst the Jews where there was direct revelation did it have historical fact, right? Another example, and we've all seen homology. They show you a picture of a man's arm, of a, of a dolphin, uh, you know, a fin, of, of a bat's wing, and right, all the same. Right, right. People are like, that proves evolution. It's like, well, I agree with the data, but there's two different ways to, you know, you talk about this in your book. That looks like design to me, that the same designer doesn't keep reinventing the wheel. So what we're getting at is there's a difference between data and the interpretation of data. Uh -huh. So if... Every ancient culture separated from each other has a story of a dying and rising God. It seems to me that that desire was implanted in them. Why does it pop up everywhere? And so it makes sense to me that when the God who created all of us, who wrote eternity in the hearts of men, who put this, that when he enacts his salvation, he will do it in a way that we will recognize. Look, it, okay, if Jesus comes into the world, and he fulfills all of the Old Testament law and prophets, as Christians believe. But what he did spoke not a word to the pagans. It would seem like a foreign invasion because Jesus is the, the, the Jewish Messiah, but he's also, we believe, the Savior of the world. And so the way I like to put it is Jesus not only fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets, he fulfilled the highest yearnings of the pagan people. If he came into the world and it meant nothing to the pagans, then it would, would, it's got nothing to do with us. But no, it turns out that he has fulfilled specific Old Testament prophecies, but he is also the true myth, the true Dionysus, the true uh, Hercules, but without the horror of those Greek myths. And, and, and it, uh, I mean, you know, I just want to ask, because this is such a big idea. Um, that moment uh, on Addison's walk in Oxford, England, when... Tolkien suggests this to Lewis. And of course, Lewis writes about this uh, in his memoir, Surprised by Good. Joy. You, you wonder, um, Tolkien, obviously, who loved myth like crazy, must have been thinking about this himself for yeah. many years because he knew 
the myths, the Norse myths. And there's that line in Surprised by Joy where Lewis is quoting Longfellow's poem oh, yes, yes. about the Norse god, Balder the Beautiful is dead, is dead. And it's this haunting, why, he was asking the question, why is this haunting me? Right. I'm reading about some fictional yeah. Norse god, but it haunts me like it somehow speaks to some part of me. And that's the connection is that is. he's saying, I mean, th th this is what you're saying in your book, I, I, I assume, is that he recognized that there's something deeper that, that my, my being moved by that myth, it's not just, oh, it's what I like. Yeah. It, there's something deeper. See, my least favorite word today, Eric, is the word trigger. But I'm going to use a good use of the word trigger. That when we come in the presence of something like that, it triggers something deep inside of us. It opens up a yearning. It opens up an old wound. That's what Lewis... And by the way, anybody that's interested in Tolkien that wants to get Tolkien's understanding of this, read his brilliant essay on fairy stories. Oh. And the last section is partly about this, how that, that, that the story of Jesus hollows, H-A, hollows every other myth because he is the Lord of men, but also of elves, and that wonderful ending of on fairy. And if you love Lord of the Rings, that's a, a great analysis of fairy stories and what so it means to read Tolkien's that. Tolkin's essay on called fairy On Fairy yeah, Stories. It's sort of a long essay that sometimes is published as a book. It's so funny because Tolkien wrote that essay. Uh, Lewis wrote an essay very similar. Called The Myth Made Fact. Or the myth, oh, yeah, the myth is, became fact. Is Actually, that the myth became fact? That's it, the name of it. I yeah. thought he had an essay that was like on fairy stories. It was, it was sort oh, of like on. Oh, on yes, yes, it, it is called. Uh, there's one on, on science fiction, and sometimes fairy stories say what need to be said. He did write a lot about that. L it, Lewis wrote a lot about this, and of course, both of these figures look back to Chesterton, right? Oh, yeah. Who, in his classic book Orthodoxy has my favorite chapter, The Ethics of Elfland. Elfland. And Elfland is fa the world of fairy tales and the world of... All of which, and it's why I love Addison, I, lo I love the poem that I was beginning to quote. It, it, it's their way of saying that the world of fairy tales, the once upon a time, that's pointing to the kingdom of heaven. It's right. pointing to this real world. Right. It's not fake. It's pointing to something real. Um, because there are people who love fairy tales and they, they, they don't know why they and do, you know, but it's, there's it's something like, about like it. in your memoir, when you talk about your dream of the golden fish, if God just sent that to you out of the blue, it wouldn't have meant anything. It's everything in your life built up to that moment. So when you have that dream, all of the yearnings of your whole life, being on the top of the mountain, all that stuff, they come together. And it's a, I, I don't want to go off on this, but my favorite show these days is The Chosen. I'm leading my international Bible study through it. And basically what they do is they give backstories to all of Jesus's disciples. And some purists are like, oh, don't make that up. Look, folks, we need to do that. Because when God does a miracle today, he doesn't just do it out of the blue. It is the climax moment of everything God is doing in your life, your community, your family, right. whatever. And so it's the same thing. that The seeds of the gospel are there in the myth. Uh, uh, about 15 years ago, I wrote a book called From Achilles to Christ. I talked about the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Greek tragedies, how they point forward to Christ. Right. But then I said to myself, you know what? I need to go deeper because behind the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid are this great reservoir of myths that nobody actually writes. Okay. They, they are, I don't, I don't remember where I read this, Eric, but I read somewhere that each you and I, we, we have a dream and it's a dream. But when an entire community dreams together, that's where you get a myth from. And the myths are the raw material of all this great literature that I love so much. And so I said, I've got to go back to the source, right? To, to the source that gets the folk, the people, what we all yearn for. That The Brothers Grimm did not write those fairy Correct. tales. They collected them, collected. right? Uh, and, and the same thing, there was a guy in France, different ones that have done that. Uh, oh, except for Hans Christian Andersen, he wrote those. He's very different. But most of the time, people are collecting. And Oscar Wilde. Uh, that's right, Oscar Wilde. Yeah, that's right. He wrote his own stuff, too. He's wonderful. I wish you could have interviewed him here, too. Maybe Would I can. It? Maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, well, people should read Joseph Pierce's biography yes, of good. Oscar Wilde. Amazing. Well, in any event, Lewis is not there yet. He's having right, this right. conversation with, uh, with Tolkien and Hugo Dyson late at night, and... Tolkien suggests... It's just that little suggestion. What if the story of Christ 
is the myth for the one time in history that became a fact. Did Lewis... It took about a week. Okay, I was just going to yeah, say, about did, a week. like, how long did it take? Hit? And we have some letters he wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves. And about a week later, he was with his brother, Warren, a couple years older, and they were driving. Remember the motorcycle with the sidecar? And they were driving to the Whip's Name Zoo. <laughs> And this, Lewis, this is one of those famous things. I actually, I, you know what? I wrote about this in my book, Miracles. Oh, you write, yeah, yeah, I wrote about this whole story. I forgot. The, the, it, it's like you want to make it up because yeah, it's, so it's so delightful. So, so, yeah. so basically he said, we set out for the zoo. Yeah. And when we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. But by the time we got there, I believed it. I wasn't really having a theological discussion. Just something opened, like a window opened. And same, the same thing with your, with your memoir. Suddenly... It makes sense. Suddenly it is real and everything changed. Now, Lewis, uh, uh, at his funeral, uh, one, one of the people said that Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man I ever met. Now, that doesn't mean he was a goody two-shoes. It doesn't mean he did altar calls in his class. We didn't usually do that. But it meant every aspect of his life was changed by this new worldview that God became man. That changed. So it's in everything, even when he read. And I try to do that with Lewis. I write specifically Christian books, but I write books that are a little bit more secular, but they're always undergirded by a Christian worldview, by that reality. Man is, you know, in God's image, but fallen, right? That's what I, I learned from Lewis. I even wrote, just like you, I've written some children's stuff as well, uh, because well, we love Lewis, so we have to do it, you know? <laughs> I, li I, li I literally forgot that I had written about this story in my book, Miracles, because I, what I love is the specificity, the weird specifics that, you know, okay, they have this, t the, this walk, uh, this, this late night talk on Addison's walk and, and the idea is planted. And then a week later, like this is kind of percolating and percolating. And then a week later he gets into the side car. This is what I love into the side car of his brother's motorcycle. Yeah. And these two bachelor brothers drive to the zoo. Yeah. And so CS Lewis is converted in a sidecar. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he arrives at the zoo. It's like, okay, I'm in. It's I mean, like, it's you. Well, you know what? You wouldn't make to. that it's, up. It's like who, who would make waking that? up. It's funny because of the new. When we'll go into the new meaning of the word woke, but waking up to reality. It's like you've been sleeping, and all of a sudden you are awake to the nature of truth, God, man, and the universe, and it all comes together, and it all has meaning, and so, it clicks. L Lewis uses that idea it's like waking up someplace in one of his writings but he talks about that yeah. it's that feeling of waking up um and you know if people are interested in what we're talking about the great max mclean did a one-man show called the most reluctant convert where he acts out jack and tells his story from surprised by joy but a few years ago they made it into a movie and it's it's kind of that weird space between a movie and a documentary because we're hearing max present it while it's being dramatized. And it's very good. It's only about an hour and 15 minutes called The Most Reluctant Convert. And it does a wonderful job getting us into the mind. And, and Max has now made a sequel called Further Up and Further In. That hasn't been made into a movie yet. But I'm, I'm sure he comes to New York City in different places. I saw it in Houston a couple months ago. Uh, and and it, it's, 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 a, it's a giant... Eric, here's the wonderful thing for, for, for men like you and I. Okay. Now, again, we didn't grow up evangelical, but... If you grow up evangelical, the bad thing about it is sometimes they're suspicious of the imagination, suspicious of anything that has to do with magic. I want to tell you this, that the young Lewis loved myth and magic and wonder, all of that stuff. Then when he became an atheist, he felt like he had to get rid of it because I'm a serious guy now. It's like I got to burn all yeah. my super tramp yes. records. Ex exactly. Except and then when he became a believer, it allowed him to reaccess his love of wonder. Isn't that a wonderful uh, sort of testimony? that I was allowed to go back to myth because I was a Christian. That, that's, well, that's an important thing for Americans. There, are, ma there are many uh, people, they'd be more in the fundamentalist camp or the pietistic right. camp, mm. that they're, they're so wary of anything that is not the Bible, for yeah, example, yeah. and they say that anything magical, so, so they... they they're deeply uncomfortable with Lewis. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I love Lewis so much is that he redeems all of the classical myths. I mean, anybody who's read the Narnia Chronicles, wow. I mean, if, the, the way If you want to that. stretch a Calvinist, all you have to do is say, C.S. Lewis said, he was going, right? Yeah. C.S. Lewis never stops talking about free will, but they love him. Okay, <laughs> it's wonderful sort of stuff. But Lewis, 
look, I love the people I mentioned before, Lee Strobel, Francis Schaeffer, uh, I mean, I don't know the Francis but Chuck Colson. But the American apologist is a very left brain thinker. Everything said, I, I like that. We need that. But Lewis had this way, and, and Schaefer you, you, had it. You, you uh, and I are, are trying to change yeah. that. Yeah, bring reason <laughs> and imagination right. together. We have to appeal to the whole person right. and not leave the imagination out, right? The imagination is also created by God. It's also fallen, but so is reason, right? We, 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 we work together. To, and, and here's the funny thing. I'm going to go off on this, but I would argue that evolution, the, the pure Darwinian evolution, macro evolution, that the power it has is not rational at all. It's completely imaginative because it's just like the transporter in Star Wars, right? In Star Trek, okay? It's absolute nonsense. And you're going to take a body, turn it into atoms, your brain, and bring it back to you. Complete nonsense. But you can imagine it. You can see those people, and right, they come right, back, right. And, and exactly the same thing. Evolution, macroevolution is as silly as those drawings by Escher, right? Where this becomes it. But you can imagine, you can see it, and therefore, just like the branching tree has completely been disproven by paleontology, but it's such, you know, we're talking about the branching of the, of the but it's because it's so powerful, it, it stays in people's minds, even though it's been completely disproven. Okay, t t talk again about the branching tree. I want to make sure that I'm okay. tracking with this. The, the branching tree is the Darwinian idea of descent by modification. Common descent. Common descent, right? That you keeps going at branches here, branches here, branches here, all the way up to the top. That is absolutely not what the paleontology shows. Paleontology shows like a grassy field with individual stalks coming up and then some of them die out. So the fossil record does not support, it does not support the, the model put forth by Darwin and uh, evolutionists have been writhing to <laughs> solve that problem for many decades. Yeah. Some of them have been more honest about it, yeah. like... Uh, Stephen Jay Gould Stephen and Jay others. Gould, who basically saved Darwinism by destroying it. Because Darwinism, the, the absolute essence of Darwinism is nature makes no leap, no saltationism in Latin. And basically he said punctuated equilibrium, X jumps. It's like, so you've just saved Darwin by destroying it. By, cre crazy. by creating a, a term in any yeah. event. But so we'll take us back. But it's the imagination the, the power this idea of the imagination. Of, of how does that, you know, when you say the power of imagination to explain something, you know, right. is that why people fall in love with... Uh, 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 Darwinism, because they say, "Oh, it it, it makes sense. I, I can see that, I can see it. even I can, though reality yeah. may not bear that out. It's a beautiful idea." 